Well, we are in the middle of Advent. It's the season in which we celebrate God coming to earth in human form as one of us. And we are in the midst of a series that is on the passion of Jesus Christ and talking and focusing in on what Jesus did on the cross. And during this season, the reason why God came in to be one of us was ultimately to die and to rise again from the dead. And that sounds like an odd thing, that God would go all that length just to die, and that is his purpose. But we have been looking for all of the different ways in which Jesus still, in this way, it, his death is applicable to us today. What did he accomplish on the cross? And so today, if you would turn with me to John chapter 4, we're going to explore that a little bit. And Christ suffered and died to become for us the place where we meet God. In John chapter 2, uh, Jesus was pretty angry. He went to the temple and there he found a whole bunch of people selling things to people that, and they were taking advantage of them. They were selling them over overpriced materials and animals so that they could make their sacrifices at the temple. And they were refusing the animals that they brought as unworthy and that they had to buy from them. And this made Jesus indignant and made him angry. And so he started driving the people out of the temple, out of the temple courts, all of the money changers started overturning tables, started whipping around, and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they asked him, what sign will you give us that you do these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. And the Jews replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. And you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. You see, to the Jewish mindset, what Jesus said was absolutely ridiculous. Because they remembered from their history, they'd all learned from the time they were little, that David was the king of all kings in terms of any earthly king. And his son Solomon was the one who had built the temple, and that was the glory days of Israel, in which the temple, one of the great wonders of the world, this great spectacle, they would go and they would offer their sacrifices. That's where they would go to meet with God. That's where they would go to learn about God, where they would go to worship. And for Jesus to come in and say, this temple is going to be destroyed. And you destroy this temple. And I'll raise it again in three days. That was an absurd concept. It took 46 years to build that temple. Herod, the, the great, the not so great, he <laughs> built that temple and he restored it to a glory that, that made them all proud and they would all boast about the beauty and the glory of the temple. And it was outside of their ability to even imagine that there was any place else that you could go to worship God. Any place else that you could go to meet with God. And Jesus says, destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. On another occasion, he was talking to them and he says, one greater than the temple is here. Speaking about himself. And what Jesus was essentially saying in both of these passages is that this temple is no longer going to be the place where you are going to go to worship God. I am the place where you are going to go to worship God. I am now that temple. And no one can come to the Father except if they go through me. And that just made them mad. They just wanted to kill him. And I had you turn to John chapter 4. And what's going on in John chapter 4 is that Jesus was on his way through Samaria, which a good Jewish boy just wouldn't do. Okay? And 
he went to Samaria because he knew that there was a woman there that he was going to have a divine appointment and conversation with. Let me explain why a good Jewish boy wouldn't go through Samaria. You see, I talked about David and Solomon and Solomon erecting the temple, but after Solomon died, his son took over and he made some very bad decisions. And because of his bad decisions, the kingdom of Israel, which was united and glorious, became separated into northern and southern kingdoms of Israel. And it's not universally true, but generally true that those who wanted to kind of go their own way, do their own thing, went up north. And those who wanted to have some kind of semblance of the way it was and what they should be doing, they stayed down south. Because down south is where Jerusalem was. Down south is where the temple was. Down south is where everybody was supposed to go three times a year for the Feast of Israel. They were supposed to go to the temple to make their sacrifices to worship. And so up north, they erected their own places of worship. They started doing this down south too. And God started warning them through the prophets saying, turn back to me, the one true God, the one you're supposed to worship. Worship in the way that I've told you to. Worship me for who I am and who I've revealed myself to be. But instead, they kept on erecting these idols and these places of worship. And God said, if you don't stop it, I'm going to have to judge you. You're going to have to experience the consequences. And still, they didn't listen. And so the northern kingdom went first, and they were taken captive by the kingdom of Assyria. And at the time, they were the world empire, and they were brutal. But they were also smart. One of their, their best strategies was when they conquered a people group, what they would do is they would displace them and scatter them throughout their entire empire. And then they would replace those people with people from all different people groups, and they would occupy the place they had just conquered. And what you do when you have this strategy is all of a sudden you rip away a people group's identity from them. All of a sudden, they're around all sorts of people that spoke a different language, had a different way of doing things, had a different culture, had a different religion, and the likelihood that any one group, group of people was going to rise up and rebel and overthrow the Assyrian Empire, or even attempt it, was very, very minimal. So a brilliant strategy. And in fact, it worked, because the people in the northern kingdom that went into exile here, they started intermarrying. And so what happens, and when God said, don't intermarry with the peoples, what happened is the genetic code of the Israelites started to get mixed in with all the different people groups. So there were no more pure Jewish people within the northern kingdom, which is now Samaria. And not only did they have their own genetic code, but they also had their own style of worship. They had their own places of worship. They had their own way of worshiping. And they had their own Bible. The Old Testament that we know of wasn't completely acknowledged by the group in the Northern Kingdom. Only certain selected books. And so what you need to know is that they had this, their own view and their own brand of Judaism. And the southern kingdom got judged too, but they went into Babylon. Again, very powerful and very smart. Except that Nebuchadnezzar had a different strategy. He would take the best and the brightest of any people group, he would bring them into his palace, train them in the way of the Babylonian culture, and try and enculturate them and utilize their talents and skills and abilities in his kingdom. Again, trying to rip away the cultural identity. But because he didn't separate them as a people, they continued worshiping Yahweh. They started forming synagogues where they would meet, and they would still worship as a people. And when Babylon became Persia, Persia sent them back home because God told them to. And when Persia sent them back home, they started rebuilding the city of Jerusalem. They started rebuilding the temple. And they started worshiping again. 
and they had a pure genetic code. They had pure worship. They had the pure text of scripture. And what happened is that the northern kingdom, the Samaritans, became known as half-breed Jews. And so when you're reading your New Testament all over the place, you see this hatred for Samaritans. And if you've ever wondered why, that's why. They were seen as half-breeds. They were seen as not true Jews. They were seen as corrupt Jews. And so you just didn't associate with Samaritans. And that's where we come. Jesus has this conversation with a woman who had a bad reputation. She'd been married several times, and now she's living with somebody who isn't her husband. And she's not even allowed to go with the other women out to the well to get water at the same time. She was a castaway from that society. Another reason Jesus shouldn't have been talking to her. And Jesus calls her on this, on her lifestyle, and she says, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. So she changes the subject. And in John chapter 4, verse 20, she asks a question. She says, our fathers worshipped on this mountain. That was Mount Gerizim in Samaria. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. And again, what Jesus is saying is, you're asking the wrong question. Her question had to do with geography. Should we worship here or should we worship there? And Jesus says, well, a time's coming where neither is going to be relevant because I am the place of worship. If you want to come to the Father, you have to come through me, Jesus would say, over and over and over again. And when Jesus ascended into heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit descended on his people, the church, And anyone who believes in Jesus from that time on, the Holy Spirit now dwells on the inside of you. Where is Jesus right now? He's at the right hand of God, but he's also on the inside of you. So where do you have to go to worship? Anywhere you want. Now, we come because it's convenient and it's nice to have a building. It's nice to have these four walls and a place and all these instruments and sound equipment and and screens and all of those things. It's great, but we don't have to have any of these things to come into the presence of God and to worship him. Because Jesus is the place of worship. You know, it's easy to look at her question and think, well, that was so silly. And to think, you know, well, she was stuck on a geography, you know, I have to go to a certain place in order to worship God. But really what Jesus was saying was, your question has to do with the external of worship. Where do I go? How do I do it? What's the order in which I do it? But Jesus says, God looks at the inside. He looks at the internal, that you must worship in spirit and in truth. That means that you must worship with the power of the Holy Spirit, that you must have the Holy Spirit. You must be a believer in Jesus Christ in order for your worship to mean anything, but spirit has another meaning, doesn't it? It means passion, it means drive, it means what's flowing out of you, what's bursting out. As Jesus said, he who believes in me will have fountains of living water that will burst forth from them. And you just can't help but sing and to praise God with all you have and not hold back. 
to tell anybody who will listen to you, even those who won't, that Jesus is God. But so often we, just like she did, and just like they were so focused in general at that time period, we focus so much on the external of worship. All of our questions, all of our discussions, all of our arguments about worship have to do with what instruments should we use? What song should we sing? Should we sing Isaac Watts or should we sing Chris Tomlin? <laughs> How should we have our church service arranged? What's the order of worship in which God will accept? What's the style of music that we will use? And Jesus says, wrong question. You must, and by the way, the word must doesn't appear very often. It's one of those words that's like, this is a demand of God. If you are a follower of his, you must worship in spirit and in truth. That means you don't just have the Holy Spirit and you don't just worship with passion, but you have to worship the right thing. Just worshiping in general, everybody worships. I mean, just look at the football game today. Everybody worships. It's just a matter of what you're worshiping. Everybody worships. But it's not the same thing to say, I worship Muhammad, or I worship Buddha, or I worship Jesus. They're not the same thing. And they were different people who taught different things, started a different religion that emphasizes different things. You have to worship the one and only true God. Worship in spirit and in truth and worship him in the way for who he has revealed himself to be and how he has said he wants to be worshipped. We must worship in spirit and in truth. And this is how far what Jesus was saying. This is how bold his claim was. He said... Essentially, I'm the place of worship. So do you want to see God? In John chapter 14, verses 8 and 9, Philip said, one of his followers, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? So if you want to see God, you have to see Jesus. Do you want to receive God? Matthew 10, 40 says, He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives the one who sent me. To receive God, you have to receive Jesus. Do you want to have the presence of God in worship? 1 John 2, 23 says, No one who denies the Son has the Father. And whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Do you want to honor the Father? John chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. If you're talking to anybody from any group of people and they cannot answer this question accurately, is Jesus God? If they cannot answer that question with an absolute yes, not he is a God, he is like God, he is God. They are false and they are not worshiping him in spirit and in truth. There's a story from a pastor that I listen to a lot. His name is Mark Driscoll, and he's in Seattle, Washington. And he had a friend who was involved with a denomination that was going the wrong way. And by the way, his point in the story was that you can't judge any group of believers wholeheartedly. Because in any group you have those people on the inside who genuinely love Jesus and they're trying to make a change. So he had a friend that was within the leadership of this group and he asked him, can you please, you know, they're looking, they're asking the question, how can we get young people to come to church? Can you please come out and consult with them? Can you, you know, 
can you help me out? So he went because he was his friend. And when he got there, the first question off their lips is, how do we get young people to come to church? And he says, who is Jesus? And they're all looking at each other like it's a trick question or something. And he said, no, seriously, this is, this is where you come in. I ask you a question. Who is Jesus? Now let's play word association. Anybody, any word that comes to your mind, just describe who is Jesus. I say Jesus, you say? Okay. They said eventually, well, he was a really great teacher. And that's all they could say. And he said, I'm sorry, I can't tell you how to bring young people into your church. And he said, in fact, if you can't answer this question right, I want your church to be as small as it possibly can. I want you to have a very small following. In fact, I want you to kind of just die. Because if you can't answer back to me that Jesus is God, then I can't tell you how to bring young people into your church. Because he said that Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. If I be lifted up, I will draw all people to himself. Now, I want you to think about that person, those, those people in your life that don't know Jesus. Okay, I want, have you got them? Have you, are you picturing them? Are you thinking about them? Okay. Jesus said, nobody can come to the Father unless the Holy Spirit draws them. And he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Whoever it is that you're thinking of right now, if you've ever wondered what the connection is between worship and evangelism and sharing your faith, this is it. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. When we worship Jesus, when we say we love you, when we say thank you, when we praise him, when we pray to him, when we pray for the people that he's placed in our life, when we engage in life with them, what they see is the way that God intended our life to be lived out in giving praise and glory to the Father and shining forth because we're living the way that he said to live in wisdom and in truth and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And when they see that, there is an attraction that happens. And I was reminded of this just this last week, once again, that the people that are in my life are watching, that they're paying attention. Somebody in our family got sick. And he's in the hospital, and the family called us, and they're wanting me to do the memorial service. It's, and it was a reminder that I have a relationship with these people, but not a really close one. And it was a reminder that they are paying attention. They're watching. And when something happens in their life, they know who to go to. Even if they don't believe now, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. And as we close, I just want to talk to those in the room who may not know Jesus personally. You're not here by accident. You're here because somebody in your life has been praying for you. You're here because somebody in your life invited you or they shared something about God with you. And if you're here and you've never accepted Jesus and you want to right now, if you want to close that gap between you and God, if you want to have forgiveness of your sins and go to heaven when you die. We talk about the ABCs of this church. A, that you acknowledge that you have intentionally rebelled against God. And the Bible calls that sin and says, for every sin, 
we all deserve death, which is separation from God. B, that you believe that Jesus died for your sins and rose again from the dead, and that you can't have salvation through anybody else because nobody else has died for your sins. C, completely surrender your life over to him. And it's simply handing over the control and saying, Jesus, I know that I'm not in control and I want you to take control. And from this day forward, I will submit my life. Come into my heart and change me from the inside out. And you can do that from the privacy of your own seat. You can grab the person next to you and have them walk through it with you. I'd be glad to do that as well. In fact, anybody in this room, I'm sure, if they believe in Jesus, would be happy to as well.